chance to introduce myself to this class. We introduce all these guest speakers, but uh, here's my chance to introduce me. So I'm, I'm Anthony Amon, many of you already know. It's my email if you want to find me. Um, some of you, especially those of you who are in my section, may wonder how it is that I know so little about plants, being that I'm a professor of botany at UH, right? Well, so here's the, here's the reason, I'm gonna let you in on the secret, is that I don't really know much about plants. I don't teach very much about plants. My focus is really fungi. So that was my first love ever since middle school, all through high school, I volunteered studying fungi for a, a museum in Chicago, all through college, I studied mycology, and, and here I am now. So um, this is really the focus of my research, what I'm passionate about, what my lab is passionate about, and if none of you have had a chance to study fungi in depth, uh, I urge all of you to enroll in mycology this fall, which is being taught through the botany department. It's a 400 level class with a lab. It's awesome, it'll open your eyes to so much. Uh, so with that being said, let's talk a little bit about fungi. I'm going to give an overview of, of fungi with a capital F, what they are, what they do, and then we're going to dive a little bit more into the diversity of fungi found in Hawaii, since that's what these classes are about. So um, fungal diversity means a lot of different things. Of course, there's mushrooms that we all know about and like to look at. Um, we have these funky things called earth stars that we're going to talk a little bit about bird's nest fungi. We also have um, some interesting, uh, more cryptic diversity. Pylobolus, which grows in dung, endophytes, which grows inside the cells of leaves uh, and of roots in plants. Um, we also have uh, these, these types of yeasts, which you can find in soil and in the air that we breathe. And even some real basal uh, fungi, maybe fungi, maybe not fungi, such as these chytrids which are probably uh, very, very far down um, towards the base of the eukaryotic branch of life. So maybe a common ancestor between us and humans. So we like to study fungi in botany departments really just because fungi don't move very fast, plants don't move very fast, and it's a convenient way to organize that. But in fact, fungi are much more closely related to animals than they are to plants. So fungi would actually probably evolutionarily fit better in a zoology department. But that's not going to happen in our lifetime, so we'll get over it. Um, we have about 100,000 species of fungi described. Those are the names that, that we've put on fungi, uh, Latin binomial. So compare that to plants where we have about half a million species described. You can see fungi is lagging pretty far behind. Uh, nobody in their right mind thinks that that's at all reflective of the actual diversity on Earth. Um, estimates based on sort of the ratio of plants to vascular plants back in 1990 and around 2000, estimated maybe 1.5 million species. That's an old estimate. This was before people really started using genome sequencers to examine the diversity of fungi. Um, that's pretty outdated and we think it's a lot higher. Uh, if you assume that there's a constant relationship between the diversity of insects and the diversity of fungi, we'll talk a little bit about why that might be. Um, we maybe think that maybe there's closer to 3 million fungi, um, based on the fact that there's 30 million insect species and about 10% of those have some sort of obligate fungal associate, either in their gut that helps them manufacture food, or a parasite that, that maybe grows on their thorax and attacks them. That's that estimate. The most recent estimate um, that's plausible gives us a ceiling of about 5 million species. I personally think that's an underestimation, and I think that uh, we're going to look back on this and laugh. I think we're probably off by maybe an order of magnitude, but um, that's just my hunch. So anyway, the point is there's a lot of diversity out there, a ton of diversity, very, very little of it uh, we have a handle on. We can say anything about what these fungi look like, what they're doing, much less put a name on. Um, so, given that there's so much diversity, what are these fungi doing? It turns out they play a lot of different ecological roles, uh, many of which are, are sort of critical for life on Earth. Uh, first of all, they're saprotrophic. Saprotrophic means that they obtain their nutrition from dead organic materials or from inorganic substrates. A leaf falls in a forest, whether or not you hear it, fungi is going to eat it. If the fungi didn't eat it, um, those nutrients, that carbon, that nitrogen, that phosphorus, 
would have a really hard time and would take a long time getting cycled back into the ecosystem. Uh, fungi do it very efficiently. Uh, they can break down wood, um, which is something that's, that's incredibly hard to do. Animals can't digest wood. So this is a role that fungi has to play, to turn the wood back into its, um, its organic compounds and back into soil so that new plants can grow. Uh, they also have some biotrophic roles as well. Saprotrophics on, on dead stuff, uh, biotrophics on, on living substrates, on living animals, on living plants, right? So we can also call this uh, symbiotic, symbiotic, this relationship with living <coughs> organisms. Sometimes we get confused with this definition and we think symbiosis means uh, mutualistic, so that one, both partners benefit at the same time. In fact, symbiotic just means that two living organisms are living together, and that can be a parasitic relationship as well. So it just means two biological organisms living together. Fungi live on all sorts of living things. They're living on you guys right now. Your scalps are crawling with fungi. Your feet are almost certainly crawling with fungi. Um, animals, uh, insects, and of course plants associate with fungi as a matter of course. Some of those associations are, are pathogenic, which means they can be harmful for the host. Uh, plant pathogens, we've maybe talked a little bit about um, rapid ohia death right now, which is killing some of our ohias. This is an example of a, a pathogenic relationship with a fungus, between a fungus and a plant. Um, there's commensal relationships where uh, two organisms are, are just hanging out, not really affecting each other's fitness in any way, so neither harming nor, bene nor benefiting either of the partners. And this is probably actually the majority of relationships that are biotrophic with fungi. Even though the, the mutualistic ones and the pathogenic ones get all the press, uh, all those fungi that are living on your body right now, they're not really hurting you, they're not really helping you, they're just there. Lastly, we have uh, a few key examples of, of mutualisms, where this association between a fungus and another living organism uh, benefits the fitness of one or both of those partners. Uh, we heard about lichens. Uh, that's a great example of a mutualistic relationship. Uh, those, those algae don't live without their fungal symbionts, and those fungi don't live without their algal symbionts. But together, uh, they're a force to be reckoned with, and they inhabit some of the most hostile places on Earth. Um, we have some insect mutualisms, again, especially insects that tend to feed on very uh, oligotrophic or nutrient-poor substrates. There's insects that, that tap into the sap of plants. There's not a whole lot of nutrients in sap, so they require bacteria in their guts to actually manufacture some of their amino acids so that they can continue to, to survive and produce proteins. Um, and of course, mycorrhizae, where a um, a plant associates with a fungus. This is a great uh, image, and it's really small here, but this is a cover to uh, the textbook on mycorrhiza. What you're looking at are three pine seedlings that are growing. Uh, the roots of this pine are right there, right there, and right there. So there's three little roots on this pine, and all of this other white stuff that's growing around is all fungus. So in essence, the, the plant is, um, is delegating uh, its root system to a fungus. The fungus gets water and nutrients and gives it to the plant, and in exchange, the plant is giving the fungus um, photosynthates and sugars so that that fungus can survive. It's obligate, neither this pine tree nor this fungus would be able to survive without the other. So uh, this is widespread throughout nature, I should mention. About 90% of plant families have these mycorrhizal symbioses. So um, we can assume that we wouldn't have land plants without their mycorrhizal symbionts. Okay, so fungi are important. Why else should we study fungi? Everybody, everybody stand up for a second. We're gonna do a little exercise. Um, who can tell me what this is a picture of? That's Manoa campus. Yes, very good. This is Manoa campus, right? We are know, somewhere around there. Um, so let's assume that we have uh, about a foot and a half of soil on Manoa campus. This is just main campus, right? This isn't uh, lower campus, this isn't the Arboretum, we're not counting Kiwala or Coconut Island, just main campus. Okay, let's assume that, that all of you guys have uh, REU funding, or you're doing you know, some sort of undergrad research in somebody's lab, and all of your friends are too, and all of their friends are too. And so we got all of you uh, nice dissecting microscopes and really, really small tweezers, 
and your job was to go through campus, um, dig up all of this soil, and pick out all of the fungal mycelium out of the soil. Okay, so we do that. Everybody um, gets together at the end of the day, or the year, or the millennium, however long it takes, and we line up all of that mycelium end to end. Okay, this is why I wanted you to stand up. When I say the proper distance, I want you guys to sit down. How many of you guys, you can sit down if you think this is right, think that that mycelium would reach all the way from here to Waimanalo? Okay, everybody's still standing, pretty good. So, so it would go farther than Waimanalo. Would it go to uh, Molokai? Okay, how many of you guys think that it would reach all the way to California? Oh, all the way to California. So some people think maybe not that far. What about to um, Copenhagen in Denmark? Would it go that far? Maybe not. To the moon? Would it reach the moon? Uh, would it reach the moon? Would it reach the sun? Would it, reach, would it go to the sun and back? Would it go to the sun and back 30,000 times? It would. So we, we would estimate that in a single um, square inch of uh, soil, we have about 200 meters of mycelium. It's really small, it's really thin. You can pack that much mycelium into a square inch of soil. If you scale that up, we get about one light year of mycelium that fits into our college campus right here at UH Manila. So it just goes to show how uh, critical this substance and this life form is to our everyday lives. Uh, we really, it's really hard to imagine life without it. Um, so let's talk about the diversity of fungi in Hawaii, what we know. Um, this is sort of the Bible of mushrooms of Hawaii, which is most of what I'm gonna talk about today. It's a great book, how many of you guys have it? It's worth a fortune. If you ever need to retire, you can sell it because it's out of print now. And they sell it on Amazon for about $300. Uh, it's, a little, it's a little paperback. Yeah, so if you guys see this anywhere, snatch it up. Well, don't, no, buy it and then give it to me. I'll, 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 give, you, I'll give you a little bit less than $300. But, but this, was, uh, this was the work of a, a couple of mycologists. And prior to 1973, uh, only 23 species of, of mushrooms had been reported. So fleshy fungi, we, call, we won't get into definitions here, we'll just say fleshy things that you can tell are fungal were reported from Hawaii. Not very many. Um, by 1990, a gentleman at yeah, UH Hilo, who actually was a snail specialist, became interested in, in mushrooms because he was on Big Island, he saw a lot of them, he thought these were neat, took some photos and brought them to a big mushroom convention and got a lot of people excited. They got an NSF grant to go out and survey the mushrooms of Hawaii. So uh, they reported you know, around 100 species. After this survey uh, that was funded by NSF, they reported about 350 species of fleshy fungi, of mushrooms. Do you guys think they got them all? I don't, I don't think they got them all. These are, so these are the, this was Don Hemis, who was the professor at Hilo, and this is Demis Desjardins, who's a professor at um, San Francisco State. Uh, I don't think we got them all. So we took, uh, my lab and another fungal lab took a, a group of undergraduates and graduate students to Big Island, to Hawaii Volcanoes National Park last summer as part of a bio blitz where in 48 hours everybody goes out and tries to document as much life as they can of insects, of plants, of birds, of tardigrades, um, and of fungi. And in that, that little single foray, uh, Emily was there, right? Were you there? No, I didn't. Oh, uh, Emily wasn't there. Um, in that single foray, it was, it's the summertime, it's a horrible time to find mushrooms because most of them come out after the rain. Nevertheless, we, we tripled the number of recorded mushrooms at Hawaii Volcanoes National Park in 48 hours. Um, this is sort of our workflow. We get them, we, we sort them out, we dry them uh, on food dryers so we can keep them in our herbarium, and we take lots of notes on their color, their texture, what they look like, um, and we store them away, and we add species to the list. Um, so this was just in a single national park. There's probably tons of mushrooms right here on campus that we don't, uh, haven't recorded before, and a, a number of people are actually working on that right now to document campus fungi, because it's a great place to start. These are some of the ones that you're likely to see. I'm just gonna go through a snapshot of what this diversity looks like. Uh, many of you have probably seen this one, Leucocoprinus burnbaumii, bright yellow. Uh, it's real common flower pot contaminant. So if you have something growing 
in your you know, palm tree flower pot or in your auntie's geraniums, it's probably this one. It's real common, it's not native, it's, uh, it's commonly associated with uh, imported soil. When it gets a little bit older, it looks like this. Uh, don't eat it. <laughs> That's actually a good theme for this whole talk. Don't, you can't really eat it. Uh, this is uh, some of our, a lot of our diversity and a lot of what we think of as potentially native diversity is this group of species called hygrophorus species. And just looking at it, you can probably tell something about its habitat. Most of these are growing in mosses or in liverworts. We find these in real wet environments, um, you know, up in bogs or in the backs of valleys. Uh, they tend to be real shiny, real colorful, uh, and sort of slippery. And these are hygrophorous species. Uh, there's been a number of putatively native species that we've described. One that I really like is Hygrophorus loculani, which I think is a pretty name. Uh, and I should mention that that's the, when, when Don Hemmings and Dennis Desjardins started doing the survey, they decided that all new Hawaiian fungi that were going to be described were going to get Hawaiian names. So, so the genus is the, the Latin name so they can place it, but all the species names are Latin, or excuse me, are Hawaiian. And they typically will partner up with um, folks in Hawaiian studies or kupuna to come up with appropriate names that actually match those lifestyles, which I think is a, a really nice tradition. This one you can eat, chicken of the woods. Uh, it's delicious, it's huge, it can be about this big if you find a mature specimen. It grows on ohia, uh, downed ohia logs, um, and it tastes like chicken. Especially you just cut out sort of this outer part and it has the texture of chicken tenders. You can deep fry it, you can saute it, uh, it's delicious. And it's really, really hard to misidentify because there's not much that looks like this in a Hawaiian forest. How, yes, big is, how big did you say they can get again? They can get pretty big, oh, so you can, big. Get, you can get them maybe about that big, oh, that's pretty if big. somebody hasn't gotten to them first. The nice <laughs> thing is you can just cut out the outer edge of it too, and then it'll grow back. So this is one that's sort of perennial. Um, so you can, if you have a patch that you find, you can go back year after year and keep on reharvesting if you don't get too greedy. Morels actually grow in Hawaii. Uh, there's not a ton of them on Oahu, but there's a good number of them on Maui and on Big Island. How many of you guys have tried morels? Okay, a few of you. If you've never tried them, go to Whole Foods or maybe Kokua Market every once in a while and buy some and taste them. They're only $30 a pound. It's all, it's all it costs. But you can go pick your own for free. Um, they grow, they're real typically found after burns. So in the western United States, after these annual burn cycles, these forest fires, commercial pickers will go uh, into these burns and we'll pick these by the fistful. Um, and you can actually find them in forests here in Hawaii too. Native forests that grow. Uh, again, you have to know where to look and harvesters will be very secretive about where to go find them. But if you buddy up with somebody that knows where to go, you might just get lucky. Uh, this was a really weird morel that we found. Typically you find these growing on the ground uh, around sort of tree roots. This one was growing up out of a rock. It's not photoshopped. That's just uh, a really strange occurrence that we found. Where was this photo taken? Guys. What's that? Where was this photo taken? I forget. <laughs> um, <laughs> there's also a lot of a lot of color morphology too. So some of them are can be very dark and black. Some of them can be yellow. Um, maybe it's it's just phenotypic plasticity. Maybe it's a single species that just varies its color depending on environment. Maybe they're different species. We really haven't done the research to know. So these are the ones that are good to eat. You probably want to be careful eating uh, a few other species. This is one that's Amanita verosa. Um, Amanita is a genus uh, containing probably the most deadly mushrooms that we know of. Um, this one will grow in association with conifers. So if you are uh, around ironwoods or if you're near pine plantations on some of the other islands, you can find these growing in association with these roots. This is one of these mycorrhizal species. Um, it's really deadly, it's stark white, right? So it's like something out of a, a Disney fairy tale, right? You think the white mushroom is pure and is good to eat, but don't be fooled, this thing will kill you quick. Um, this is probably the most common cause of mushroom poisoning. And the reason is uh, it's very easily mistaken for certain types of mushrooms that are commonly harvested in Southeast Asia. So almost all of our mushroom poisonings, not just in Hawaii, but also on the continent, um, tend to be Laotian 
um, Vietnamese, um, the people from that part of the world, recent immigrants that go out into the forest, think they recognize this mushroom because it looks like something that they, they harvest all the time in, in Laos or in Southeast Asia, but uh, it turns out it's not. And uh, it's sort of a, it's a weird one. It won't kill you right away. You can eat it, it's supposed to taste delicious, sort of nutty, has a good texture, you'll feel fine, you'll go to bed, um, you'll wake up the next day with, with severe cramps, uh, like it's severe enough that you'll probably want to go to the hospital. Uh, and then it, it'll feel like you've made a miraculous recovery. That's what everybody states, that this cramping and this vomiting goes away, you feel great, you feel like a million bucks, um, and then your liver stops functioning and you die. Um, so this is, this is what happens, it's, it has what's called a, an amanita toxin that, that will kill your liver. And uh, so far it's sort of, there's not much remedy for it. You want to try and pump your stomach if you've eaten it or if your dog has eaten it, uh, but if it gets into you, there's not really a great way to stop those toxins. Uh, this one's more common in our native forests. So this one you find, even if there's not conifers around, this is Amanita marmorata. And this is probably the most common Amanita that we find here in Hawaii. It's got this sort of grayish brown cap. All these Amanitas are typified by having this, this annulus or this veil um, and also this sort of cup at the bottom of the mushroom. And so when these things are babies, they, they grow in eggs and they grow up out of that egg and it leaves these, these remnants behind so you can tell what it looked like when it was still growing up. So these are the, the, the Amanitas that you want to stay away from. Amanita muscaria is one, if you ever watched the Smurfs, you probably recognize this is our very, very iconic, sometimes this has a bright red cap uh, with white spots on it. Um, this one grows here in Hawaii, up again in pine plantations and places in, in Maui and Big Island where we have lots of pines growing. Um, it, in some parts of the world, it can be hallucinogenic. So in parts of Siberia, uh, northern Russia, old uh, cultures with shamanic traditions would eat this mushroom um, as part of healing rituals to go into trances. Um, it turns out I have no moral objection to hallucinogenic mushrooms. I think it's okay if you want to go and try that. Don't do it with this one. This one, it turns out as you go farther south, in latitude, uh, it contains less of this hallucinogenic compound and more of the toxic compound. So if you do eat this, it probably won't kill you, but it will make you very, 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 very sick. Um, so watch out. This one is very, very common in lawns, uh, especially around Manoa. So in the fall, after our first rains, you'll see a ton of these growing around campus, in the neighborhoods around campus, uh, probably all over the islands. Chlorophyllum molybdetes. It looks sort of like an amanita, right? It's got this white cap and it has these patches on it. Uh, what it doesn't have is that cup at the base of it, but it does have a little um, annulus. Um, chlorophyllum means green gills. That's the genus name. And if you flip it over, especially the mature ones have uh, this sort of greenish tint to it. Um, and it grows in lawns, as I mentioned, they can get really big, and they can form fairy rings. So they can grow in, in circles. As this, the mushroom under, underground gets larger and larger, um, those fairy rings will get also larger and larger. Um, if you are suspect that you have mushroom poisoning, or if uh, somebody ate something, or somebody's dog ate something, uh, you know, you'll call the hospital. The hospital will probably call me or my wife to help uh, try and identify what that thing was. Um, it's really helpful to take notice of your surroundings and the things that we'll want to know is whether or not there was conifers growing around because that'll give us an indication of whether or not it was Amanita. If it was on a lawn, I would say nine and a half times out of ten, uh, it was this one that gets eaten. And again, this is one that will make you very sick but probably won't kill you. And the course of action is that you really just want to try and vomit it up. Dogs seem to really like this one too. I have no idea why, but uh, we get a lot of phone calls about people's dogs um, eating these mushrooms. Dogs aren't that smart, yes. Some dogs aren't that smart. Uh, this is a picture of a puffball. And this is a, this is a calvatia. This is a puffball that we don't find real commonly here in Hawaii. But they can get big. I mean, they can get like soccer ball size. And what it is is it's a mushroom that's evolved. Rather than having its gills on the outside, it's evolved to have its gills on the inside. So it's just a completely self-contained ball of spores, if you will. 
Um, what we have in Hawaii are, are variants on this theme. Uh, this is podaxis, and this is a stalked puffball. So imagine this is a puffball, and it's on a stalk. It grows in sand. You'll find this thing growing like in sand, um, just right off the edge of the water, especially in dunes where there's some grass growing or some other coastal strand vegetation growing. Um, it, it'll grow, and it'll be totally shocking. And even in really, really dry places like, like Ka'u on south, I the south part of Big Island, you can find this growing. After, after a little bit of rain, these things will pop up all over the place, and it's really neat to see. The other variants on puffballs that we have in Hawaii are these things called earth stars. How many of you guys have seen these growing around? Like wood chips, it's real common. If you go to um, some of the botanical gardens, like Coco Crater Botanical Garden, uh, you can see this growing in those wood chips. And what this is is a um, this is a puffball that's been uh, covered up by this material, and and that thing as it dries out sort of flips inside out and raises that puffball up off the ground. So this is what I'll again, I'll show you the chrono sequence. So you can see that that bottom part here is just starting to dry and open up, and this puffball is getting raised up off the ground. This is really soft, it's really thin skin. Uh, and the way that it disperses its spores is a raindrop will fall on this and it'll puff. And it'll look like a puff of smoke. And those are just all the spores being dispersed out, um, starting new colonies. We get a lot of different species of this. I think at last count we had about 36 species of these earth stars, give or take. Uh, and we're describing new species all the time. So it's a pretty diverse group, and once you start looking at the, the minute details on these, you can see they have a lot of characters about like what their, their color is, uh, the, what this, this hole at the very top of it looks like, um, whether or not it's ornamented, where it grows. Um, this is, these are ones that are just sort of starting off, so this is when that, that pedestal is closed off before it's really emerged and been lifted up off the ground. And this is... Uh, this is all the way, so this is what they look like when they're done. And I like this one because it reminds me of like a Tintin cartoon with all those different holes on the top of it, yeah. So if you touch the top with your finger, will that also cause it yep. to pop? Yeah, if you can touch the top of it with your finger, it'll go puff, 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 and you'll see these clouds of spores. Uh, pretty fun, okay. I went a little overboard with photos of these. Uh, this is another, another uh, neat um, sort of morphology of mushroom or fleshy fungus that we have in Hawaii and elsewhere. And this is called a bird's nest fungus. And this grows on logs. This is a real close up. Each one of these is you know, half the diameter of my eyeball, maybe. Um, and what these are, are packets of spores. So each one of these little circles, that we call, let's call them eggs, because they're bird's nest fungi, contain you know, thousands and thousands of spores. And again, this is flash dispersal. So what happens is a raindrop will come from the ground They'll land in this cup, and it's a perfect parabola. So it's perfectly designed to um, lift up those spore packets and launch them uh, sort of across the forest. And in this mycology class, we have we bring some of these in, and we all take turns standing up on tables with an eyedropper, um, dropping drops of water into these these bird's nest um, fungi, and seeing how far we can disperse these these spore packets. And they can go for meters. Just from a single drop of water, it can launch these spores a really, really far distance. OK, so let's get down to, to brass tacks here. This is Dictyophora. And this is part of a, a group of fungi known as the phalales, or the, the phallus, um, for, for obvious reasons. So it has a funny shape, and then it has this, this really pretty netting. Again, we have a pretty good diversity of these. Um, these pop up, again, in flower pots every once in a while. They're not uncommon to find contaminating your, your greenhouse enterprises. Um, they, they smell horrendous. Um, this top part is covered um, with a really sticky residue. So the spores are contained up here, and then it's a sticky, smelly residue. It smells sort of like rotting flesh. Uh, how do you think these spores get dispersed? Flies. 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 When these things emerge, they get totally swamped, swarmed by flies. And the flies will land on it, eat up all that gooey goodness, fly somewhere else and disperse those spores. Um, this is just a, a picture of uh, a few of these different types of um, Dictyophora species that we have here in Hawaii. 
this group of fungus actually got quite a bit of press uh, earlier this fall. Uh, this old paper emerged that, that was written in uh, around, around 2000 or so. Um, some guy who was on Big Island uh, was studying fungi commercially, um, and he made this claim, he published this paper actually, that there was this, this ancient Hawaiian legend about a um, Dictyophora species that smelled horrible, but that um, would get women very, very excited when they smelled it. Um, and so they claimed to have done some sort of clinical test where they offered this fungus to women, uh, and about half of them spontaneously got very excited. Uh, and then, then the other half got, got very excited, but, but not that excited. Um, for whatever reason, I'm not sure how the internet works, I'm too old to really understand that stuff, it, it re-emerged and, and went viral in the, in the fall. And so um, I got several calls from the press, my wife got a lot of calls from the press wanting to know if this was true, where they could go find it. Um, this, uh, this graduate student named Christy Wilcox, who has this awesome blog called Sushi Science uh, on, as part of Discover Magazine's website, she's a marine biology grad student, um, went and wrote this, this super in-depth um, article about um, the, the, the history of this scam. Uh, and she actually goes and finds this and sniffs it for herself and uh, almost vomits. <laughs> so, so it's not true. I would love to w live in the, a world where this type of thing exists, but I might have to wait. Um, so this is, this is a picture of that species that, that does grow on Big Island in these Kipuka environments, but um, don't get too excited. This is uh, another picture of one that I get a lot of phone calls about because people think they've found some sort of alien life form. This is real similar to those Dictyophora species or those phallus species. This is called um, Aceroe rubra. It grows again in wood chips uh, in botanical gardens. You can find it bright red and it's covered in this gleba, this, this sticky, gooey spore mess. Um, and here's a picture of some flies, what it looks like after the flies are done gobbling all that up. They really do a great job um, sort of dispersing these spores. Again, I, I found a lot of pictures of mushrooms that I wanted to show you guys. Um, uh, what else is cool about Hawaiian mushrooms? Well, it turns out um, one of the more abundant genera that we have here, the genus is Mycena. You don't have to remember what it's called. It's not important. Well, it's important to me, but you guys, it doesn't matter if you remember that or not. They're pretty small. Uh, they have white spores. It's about all they have going for them. The, you know, they tend to be about that big. Sometimes they're a little bit bigger. What's really, really amazing about these, though, is that these mushrooms glow in the dark. So they have this ability to, um, to, to create phosphorescence. And a lot of the mushrooms in this genus throughout the Pacific um, can do this. Some of them are so bright that you can actually read a book by it. We're not really sure why they do it. Some people have hypothesized it has something to do with dispersal. It attracts insects at night. Maybe that's it. Maybe it's just a happy coincidence. Um, it's a really strange thing, but I think somebody is telling us that we need to study fungi more than we already do. And so they sent us glow-in-the-dark mushrooms so that we can go about doing that. Yeah, they're not radioactive, right? Um, <laughs> I have never actually checked. They might be radioactive. That sounds like a great project. <laughs> I don't think they're radioactive. No, it's actually, it's, you know, I mean, it, it's an interesting thing that this metabolic pathway um, is common throughout life. So, uh, Dinoflagellates that glow, fireflies that glow, things that bioluminesce tend to use the, the same enzyme and the same substrate to create this um, glow-in-the-dark reaction. It's called luciferin. So you can take an enzyme from a mushroom and apply it to a firefly substrate and still get the same glowing reaction. So it's, it's evolved many, many times separately um, throughout life, oddly enough. Uh, we don't really have a great answer for why that might be. Probably not ancestral. This is another one that you guys will see real commonly. Uh, I get a lot of pictures of this in my inbox and a lot of phone calls. Small, but it's bright orange. So we call this an 85 mile an hour mushroom because uh, you can spot it while you're driving down the highway. And say, ah, Favalachia calicera. This is probably the only example um, of something that we can say definitively is an invasive mushroom. Prior to 1995, uh, we had never seen or heard of Favalachia calicera growing in our native forests or any of our forests. After 1995, 
you can't help but trip over this thing if you're out hiking. Um, and so we can, we can say with certainty that this is something that's a recent introduction that's invading our forests. It's, it's probably not causing a lot of harm, but, it, but it's there. Um, and now you guys will know to look for it too. Interestingly, this is, I'll just give you a little bit of fungal, fungal anatomy. Uh, most of the mushrooms that we've been looking at so far have gills on the underside, and this is an example of one that has pores. So it functions in the same way, except instead of organized in rows, this is organized in, in little holes, and the spores will fall out of those little holes. Okay, so we're talking about um, mushrooms of Hawaii. We've had the, the bug guy has come, the, the bird guy has come, the plant guy has come. We've all talked about you know, our, our rates of endemism, uh, where these things originate from, you know, what, our, what our ratios are, and all of that. Uh, I, I won't do that. Instead, I'll tell you a story about my friend Matt. Um, my friend Matt was a, a graduate student at the University of Chicago. Uh, he lived in Hawaii for a long time, had a love of Hawaii, and decided for his PhD, he wanted to study um, a native Hawaiian mushroom. And he wanted to see whether or not the progression rule held for mushrooms. So he talked with Don Hemmies, and he talked with everybody else who, who knew something about Hawaiian mushrooms to try and find a great study system. Uh, and so he decided that he was gonna study this mushroom um, Rhodocalibia laulaha. This looks like that Amanita verosa, right? It's white, it has, a, it has a tannulus, but it doesn't have that vulva at the base, it doesn't have that cup, so you know it's not an Amanita. Um, and this was something that, that everybody thought was probably a native mushroom. We gave it a Hawaiian name, laulaha. I don't, I don't remember what it means, but it's, um, it's Hawaiian. It's described here, this is where the type specimen is. You only find it in native forests. So you only find it in pretty high elevation music forests. But by all accounts, it ought to be a native mushroom. Matt spent five long years um, collecting this mushroom from native forests all over the archipelago, did a lot of lab work, um, got ready to, to publish his thesis, actually defended his thesis. And this is another picture of it. The week after he defended his thesis, uh, he got a phone call from somebody in Texas that said, you know, I found this mushroom in this forest down in, in West Texas. It looks a lot like Rhodocolibia laulaha. Can I send you a specimen? He said, sure, send it to me. And it turned out it was the exact same species. So this thing was not endemic to Hawaii. The next week, he got another phone call from somebody in Costa Rica that had found Rhodocolibia laulaha. So this whole idea of uh, this native Hawaiian, this endemic Hawaiian mushroom, that had probably first appeared on Kauai and then hopped down the island chain, possibly speciated, was totally bogus. It turns out it's distributed all over the world. The reason that I'm not gonna show you anything about rates of endemism in Hawaiian mushrooms is because we have no idea. We have not surveyed the Indo-West Pacific enough to know whether or not we find these same things over there. We haven't surveyed North America or Europe well enough to know whether or not these same things are over there. There's so few people studying mushrooms that, that it's just a wild guess whether or not everything is everywhere or our Hawaiian diversity is really unique. All that we know is that there's a lot of diversity and we don't even have the tiniest bit of a handle on it. So um, we have some ideas of maybe how many species there are. Um, let's say based on, again, these ratios to plants, which seems to give us sort of a ballpark estimate. Those, those 300 mushrooms or so that we found um, if we have this ratio of, of two to one or five to one of mushrooms to, to angiosperm species, um, we have about 5,000 plants in Hawaii. We probably have, I don't know, maybe a couple thousand species of Hawaiian macrofungi, Hawaiian mushrooms here. So we've probably described a quarter to half of the diversity so far. Not bad, not great. That's the mushrooms. If we talk about all of the Hawaiian fungi, we've probably described maybe 10% of it. So if we start looking at soil fungi, at yeasts that are found you know, on some of our uh, native invertebrates, uh, marine fungi, stream fungi, um, you know, maybe we have 30,000 species. I tend to think we maybe have a lot more. What are these things? Um, a lot of them are gonna be really small. Uh, some of them are probably gonna be plant pathogens. So uh, some of these things that are emerging now on Ohia, 
Um, there's a lot of plant pathogens out there, and this is one way that we maintain plant diversity, is we have plant pathogens that will attack plants if they get um, too dense. If there's too many of them, there'll be an outbreak, the pathogen will knock that population down, other species will be able to coexist. What happens is when you perturb systems with climate change, uh, with habitat fragmentation, a lot of these pathogens can, can all of a sudden um, run amok and cause a lot of devastation, which is probably what's happening with our rapid ochia death right now. Um, probably a lot of fungi associated with insects. Uh, some of those may be pathogens, some of those may be symbiotic. Um, there's gotta be a ton of soil, leaf litter, and aquatic fungi. I'm gonna run out of time, so I'm not gonna be able to show you some of the work that we're doing in our lab, but we're studying fungi that live on the surfaces of leaves. And in you know, a single study from a single plant host in a single mountain range, we get about 3,000, 4,000 species of fungi. So it just goes to show that there's probably a lot of species out there. Um, let's say maybe if we count all these microfungi, uh, again, if we took all of those, those researchers who worked so hard um, lining up all that mycelia on campus, and then we sent all of you out to go discover new species of microfungi in Hawaii, these invisible things, um, maybe we could find you know, an, an additional 95% of Hawaiian fungi and above what we've discovered so far. Uh, I have a little bit of time, so I'll tell you about one of the main foci in my lab right now is studying not these mushrooms, although I love them and I think they're the neatest thing ever. It's why I got interested in fungi. Um, I've sort of switched gears and I'm studying these endophytic fungi now. What you're looking at is a, um, a light microscope image of a plant leaf that's been um, very, very thinly sectioned and peeled. And um, we've stained the mycelium that's growing in between these plant cells. So if you were to look at this leaf, uh, you know, just up to the light, it wouldn't look like it was diseased. It wouldn't look like it was infected. It would just look like a healthy leaf. But it turns out it contains a ton of fungi a lot of diversity of fungi, and that fungi is really important for that plant. A lot of what we think of um, chemical ecology of plants that protect them from herbivores, that maybe help them battle it out with other plants so they can stake out their territory, a lot of that biochemistry that we used to think was produced by the plant is actually produced by these, these endophytic fungi that are growing inside the plant. So if you isolate this plant, and grow it in a petri dish, it'll produce a lot of those so-called plant compounds all by itself without the help of a plant. Um, we found that uh, these endophytes help plants um, increase their drought tolerance, uh, and help them resist predators and pathogens, and sometimes it'll even make them grow faster. And so this is a big focus in agriculture right now too, is how to use fungal probiotics to, to produce more corn and soybeans and things like that. Um, we have a big project now where it's a four-year project. We're going out um, all over the archipelago sampling every native plant we can get our hands on and documenting the diversity of these endophytes. Um, and we're doing it two ways. We're doing it um, by a more traditional technique. We'll take these plant leaves, we'll soak them in bleach and ethanol for a couple of minutes to kill everything that's growing on the surface. And then we'll plate the little pieces of those leaves out on petri dishes, and the fungi will, will start to grow out from those leaves. Some of them it takes a while. Some of them grow in a couple of days. Some of them it takes a few months for that fungus to emerge from that leaf. But, but we can grow them. We isolate them on uh, petri dishes. Uh, we have in my lab you know, a stack that goes to the ceiling of thousands and thousands of these fungi that we've isolated from leaves. Um, and then we can study them. We can save them in, in sterile water and regrow them if we want to. We can study their DNA. We can study their chemistry. We're also using genome sequencers to sort of skip all of these steps of culturing and just taking pieces of leaf, um, sticking in a genome sequencer, and then getting a list of all the different fungi um, that are on these leaves, many of which you know, are, are new to science or haven't yet been described. So far we have about uh, 700 samples that we've taken from these plants. Um, we've sampled five islands and we've sampled about 100 plant genera so far and many individuals among these genera. Right. And I'll just say, um, 
this is, this is for our own knowledge. We want to know something about the diversity. But we're also trying to think of ways that we can actually use this knowledge to, uh, to help plant conservation. And one thing that we're doing now is actually using this idea of probiotics to take these endophytes from healthy plants and re-inoculate them into threatened and endangered plants that were not being successful growing. This is a, an endangered mint. This is Phyllostegia caolensis. There is, last time we checked, one individual remaining in the wild. Uh, all of the other populations have been totally extirpated. Uh, we can grow it okay in a greenhouse if we nail it with enough fungicide. If we don't nail it with enough fungicide, uh, a, a fungus will actually come and attack it and it won't survive longer than about a month. What's happening is we can get this thing to grow in a greenhouse okay, assuming we add enough chemical to it, but then when we try and outplant it, um, it's so weak and it's so sterile from so many courses of antibiotics and antifungals that it's completely maladapted for life outside its cage in this nice greenhouse environment. We're experimenting with inoculating these plants while they're still in a, in a greenhouse with uh, endophytes that are collected from the wild. We can add those back into the plants. And what we're seeing is that it's actually helping these plants survive this powdery mildew. Uh, and the next step is, is setting them back out into the wild and seeing whether or not they can survive out there. So this is sort of a glimpse of the future of what we can do with these, uh, these invisible but, but critically important fungi. I will um, leave it through there. I won't talk about snails uh, and snail fungi, although we had some videos that I wanted to show you the next time. Uh, and I will be happy to open it up to questions. Thank you very much. <laughs>